Using Python and Excel for data science is the best use case for professionals like you that want to have more impact at work using data. Take, for example, text analytics. Text data is everywhere. It's in Word documents, it's in your customer service chat histories, it's in the notes fields of your IT systems, and every organization has text data. Doesn't matter if you work in healthcare or government or for-profit or non-profit. Every organization is chocked full of text. And now with Python and Excel, you have the ability to extract that hidden value in your text quickly and easily. In this video, I'm gonna demonstrate a very common, very powerful machine learning technique known as Naive Bayes to perform some text analytics. In particular, what we're going to build in this video is a spam filter. And we're all familiar with spam filters, whether you're talking about email or text messages on your phone, these textual documents come in, emails, texts, they come in, and then the system, whether it's on your phone or in your email provider, analyzes the text and then says, look, is this good? Is this ham, a legitimate email, for example? Or is this spam? For example, an illegitimate text message. So you're gonna learn how to do that in this video. And by the way, just so you know, I'm also going to put a link down in the description below this video to a GitHub repo where you can find the workbook. So if you wanna download the workbook and then follow along with the video, go ahead and do that. Just know that you have to have access to Python and Excel to run the code. Now I'm gonna start this video by going over some very basic concepts in text analytics, and I'm also gonna cover the naive Bayes algorithm, including some math, so you've been warned. So if you don't wanna watch that stuff, Use the video chapters below the video to go ahead and skip ahead to the Python and Excel code if that's what you're interested in. So let's go ahead and get started by talking about document vectors. So the first thing we need to talk about is something called a document vector. This is the most common way that textual data, text documents, are represented in such a way that the computer can actually perform analytics on that data. Here's a definition here from Wikipedia. We don't really, really need to worry about that. Let's use an example to really solidify our understanding. So here is a textual document. It's probably a little bit underwhelming. It's a single sentence. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. Make no mistake though, it doesn't matter if you're talking about a single sentence or a novel like War and Peace. It doesn't really matter. Conceptually, everything works the same in text analytics, whether you have short documents or long documents. So we're gonna use a short one here. Now what we need to do is take this raw document, so this is a Python string, and we need to actually break it up into chunks, logical chunks that we can then use in our text analytics. And the process of breaking up raw textual data into these logical chunks is known as tokenization. Here it is, right? Here's a definition of tokenization. I won't read it for you. Feel free to pause the video if you'd like to read it. But the main thing we wanna know is that tokenization is kind of difficult in the modern world because not only do we have things like words and punctuation like periods and commas and that sort of thing that we need to worry about, but we also have things like emoticons, Remember those? <laughs> and we have emojis and we have symbols and all kinds of things like that. Any individual thing that's in a document that represents some sort of information to a human being, like an emoji, for example, can be thought of as a token. So it's not just words and punctuation. It's also everything else these days that we put in there. Now, we can think of our documents as being individual sentences within the document or it could be the entire document altogether. Tokenization is super important because it is the most fundamental activity undertaking in text analytics. And in this video, I can only just scratch the surface of tokenization because otherwise the video would be extremely long. Just know that this is a very basic video, but what I will show you is real world techniques that you can apply to your own data if you have access to Python and Excel. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna tokenize our document. So here we have our document. And what we can do is we can think about breaking this up into logical chunks. And an easy way to think about tokenization in the English language is tokens are separated by spaces. So for example, you might have something like this. Notice how I take each one of the individual words here and it ends up being a token. Now notice some things that are super interesting about this. Notice that even the punctuation, like the comma and the period in this particular example show up as tokens. And that's totally okay in text analytics. Sometimes you wanna keep punctuation in place because it provides information, additional information for the kinds of analyses that you're doing. Now, when we have our individual tokens, what we also need to do is say, look, what is the vocabulary of the document? And a vocabulary of a document essentially is, what is the set of unique tokens? Because for example, in the English language, words like the appear very often. So you would only want one entry for the word the, no matter how many times it shows up in your document. So we can think of that as being like a set in Python. So if I think of my tokens as a list, I can turn it into a set, and you can see here that the set is simply just the list of unique 
tokens. Okay, so this is at a high level what tokenization does. Right now in Python and Excel, there's some very limited functionality that you'd get out of the box for doing tokenization. I've asked Microsoft, I'm in contact with them, to include more functionality in future releases of Python and Excel. For example, there's a library in Python called the Natural Language Toolkit or NLTK. I've asked them to put that in because it has a lot of really awesome tokenization functionality. But in this video, we're certainly going to tokenize and it's going to be more along the lines of this than a more sophisticated tokenization strategy that we could have if we had the NLTK. Now, once we have our tokens in place, we can actually create what's known as a document vector. And this is an example of a document vector for our hypothetical document. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it, then it is a duck. And we can see here that each one of our individual tokens, right, from our set now becomes a column, becomes a feature. This is our document vocabulary. And then what we do is say, okay, based on our document vocabulary, we go through all the tokens and we just count them up. So you can see all the counts here, right? There was one comma, one period, three A's, three ducks, one quacks, so on and so forth. And this is known as a document term matrix, where every row happens to be a document, and I can have many, many rows, and then every term becomes a column or a feature. And this is a very standard representation. In fact, it's the de facto standard representation for text analytics. This is also known as the bag of words model, if you've ever heard of that before. But for our purposes, we're just going to call them document term matrices in this video. But this is how we convert raw textual document into a representation upon which we can perform analytics. Because we have our document term matrix now, we can perform analytics on it using a variety of techniques. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to build a spam filter using Naive Bayes. My next video in the series here that I'm gonna be doing, we'll talk about how to do cluster textual documents using a document term matrix. So let's talk a little bit about Naive Bayes. Okay, so Naive Bayes is a machine learning algorithm, and it's a very simple but very powerful algorithm. Like I said before, it's very commonly used in spam filters in the real world. The algorithm learns by calculating probabilities. I'm gonna show you the math, it's not all that complicated. And how Naive Bayes works is you have to feed it a collection of data, a document term matrix that has been labeled. You have to have every row is a document in your document term matrix, and then you have to have a column, an additional column, where it says, this row was legitimate, ham. This row was illegitimate, it's spam. A bunch of ones and zeros, you can think of it as yes, no's, or thumbs up, thumbs down, however you want to think of it. You need to have that. That's how the Naive Bayes algorithm learns and this process is known as training. Now, we have a great class available to us in Python and Excel called Count Vectorizer. This comes from the Scikit-Learn machine learning library. It's built into Python and Excel. And Count Vectorizer actually provides us with our document term matrices, which then we can use to train a Naive Bayes classifier or a spam filter based on Naive Bayes. Now, just so you know, the reason why the algorithm is called Naive Bayes is because it doesn't make any assumptions about what's going on in the data whatsoever. So for example, one of the things that it doesn't assume is that there's any association between words. So for example, the words Great Britain, for example, are often found together. Great Britain makes a lot of sense. Naive Bayes says, look, I don't care. If I see the word great, it's completely independent of Britain in all, in all contexts. It doesn't really matter. So that's why it's naive, because it makes this assumption when it does its probability calculations. Now, what's super cool is once you've trained a Naive Bayes model, a classifier, a spam filter in Python and Excel, you can use it on brand new data that comes in, maybe data that doesn't have a label. So for example, maybe you have in bound customer service chats and maybe you're getting spammed by bots or from hackers or something like that, you could use this naive Bayes model to see these new inbound chats and then classify them as being legit, ham, or illegitimate spam. So it's super useful. So the example data that we're going to use in the Python and Excel code is a Kaggle data set that consists of headlines, sarcastic headlines versus legitimate headlines. So that's what we're going to use for our spam filter. If the, the headline is sarcastic, then it's spam. And if it's not, then it's legitimate. And I just picked this data set arbitrarily. It doesn't actually really matter to understand the concepts, right? It's just a nice data set that you can find from the Kaggle website and play around with. We're gonna use a scaled down version of the data, the sarcastic headlines data, to cover how the Naive Bayes algorithm actually learns. So this is gonna be our document term matrix. Notice that we only have one, two, three, four terms in our 
document term matrix. And we have one, two, three, six documents, six rows, six documents, four columns, four terms. And then we have our label is sarcastic zero and one. So this would be our spam and this would be our ham. And what we need to do is then train a naive Bayes classifier from this to learn how to predict sarcastic versus non-sarcastic or spam from ham based on this data. One thing to keep in mind is that unfortunately, as far as the naive Bayes machine learning model is concerned, the entire universe is only embodied in the training data. So if I actually build a model based on this very small, almost silly data set, all it's going to know is things about government, economy, crazy, and alien. It's not going to know about any other kinds of terms. So that's something to keep in mind, right? The quality of the data, the extent of your data fully determines how powerful your machine learning model is. And in, that's true with no matter what you're doing, whether it's text analytics or any other form of machine learning. So in this case, this right here is our training data. So let's go through and see how Naive Bayes would actually learn how to build a predictive model, a machine learning model from this collection of data. All right, so the first thing the Naive Bayes model does is it says, okay, based on my training data, which is my entire universe as far as I'm concerned, I wanna figure out the probabilities of a particular document being spam versus ham, okay? So first up it says, look, I'm gonna go count up how many documents do I have in my training data set that are actually legit, that are ham? And it says, okay, I got three. And then it asks, how many documents do I have that are illegitimate or spam? And it says, well, I got three. So we can represent the probability of ham versus spam like this. So here's the mathematical representation. And let's go ahead and parse this. What does this mean? So first up, this part right here says, look, the probability a headline is legitimate. That's how you read it in English. And then we actually just go through the math. It's pretty simple, right? We know that we have three legitimate headlines in our data set here, three legitimate. And then we also know that we have six total, right? We have six total rows. That's our entire universe, half of which are legit. So the probability, all things being equal, that we're going to see a legit headline, ham, is 50%. Not surprisingly, reflexively, it's 50% for sarcastic. Again, this is a contrived example. We're just trying to learn what's happening behind the scenes with the naive Bayes model. In the real world, you'll have many thousands of rows of data and the probabilities will be a little more complicated, but this is basically what it does behind the scenes. Okay, so that's the first thing it does. What's the probability, all things being equal, of ham versus spam? Now, there's a little bit of a problem. We can't calculate probabilities where we have zeros in our data set. So what ends up happening is Naive Bayes then adds a value, which is known as alpha, to everything. And basically, by default, it's just one. And you almost never change the alpha value. You never change it from one. And what ends up happening is every cell of our data frame here, every cell of our table, gets increased by one. So that gets rid of all the zeros. And then what ends up happening is now that we've got our alpha added to all of the cells in our data frame in our table, we can then start calculating probabilities of seeing certain tokens based on the type of document. And that's a little bit confusing, so let's take a look at that. All right, so what do we got here? What we have here is only our ham or legitimate headlines. And what we wanna do is we wanna say, look, what is the probability of seeing the term government, the token government, given that we're looking at a legitimate headline? So what we can do is use mathematical notation to represent this. So here we go. It's not surprisingly, we can see this right here. And how we interpret this part right here in English is the probability of seeing government, that word, that token, given the fact that we have a legitimate headline, because notice we're only looking at the legitimate headlines. And what we do, add up all of the governments, three, two, two, so that's seven, that goes here. So the total count of government in our legit headlines is seven. And then we say, okay, how many tokens do we have in total across all of our legit headlines, all of our ham? And that's 23. So we can see that right here. So the total term count. And then what we get is a probability that says, look, given this data, which is our entire universe here of legitimate headlines, the probability of seeing the term government, given that we have a legit headline is about 30%. That's based on the data. And what we do is we just go ahead and repeat this process for every term for every column in our document term matrix, but not the label, okay? The label's separate, just the terms. And what we get is all these other probabilities. So the probability of seeing economy is about 30%. The probability of seeing legit is about 26%. And the probability of seeing alien is about 13%. And if we add these all up, they add up to 100%, approximately, because there's some rounding error here. So that's how Naive Bayes is starting to learn more about the, the way text is formed 
around legitimate headlines. And this would work, of course, similarly for any type of textual document, email, SMS text messages, documents related to finance or HR or whatever it might be. Now, not surprisingly, next up, Naive Bayes does the same thing, but for the sarcastic headlines. And what we can see here is all the same calculations. What's the probability of seeing government given that a headline is actually sarcastic? And what we see here is seven over 21, because if we add up all these, that gives us 21. And this is seven, around 33%. Probability of economy is 14%. Probability of crazy is 19%. And probability of alien is a whopping 33%. You can kind of see where this is going, right? Now that Naive Bayes has learned all of this stuff, it's learned the base probabilities of ham versus spam, and then the probabilities of tokens given a ham, and the probability of tokens given the spam, it can now actually create predictions. So let's talk about how that happens. Imagine that we have this headline here. So let's say a brand new headline comes in, a new document comes in, or an email, or an SMS text message, or a customer service chat, whatever it might be. And we do the tokenization, we get the counts, and this is what it shows up. There were two instances of government, three instances of the word economy, one instance of the word crazy, and zero alien. And what we want to do is make a prediction. Hey, is this ham or is it spam? So this is how it works. So we need to calculate probabilities. So what we do is we just start doing everything that seems pretty natural, right? So we say, first up, brand new document comes in. We need to say, look, what is the probability that's legit based on our historical training data? And what we know is that's a 50-50 split. And then we say, okay, what is the probability that we're gonna see government What's the probability that we're going to see economy? What's the probability that we're going to see crazy? Given the fact that it's legit, because what we're doing is we're considering the probability this particular inbound document is legitimate. That's what we're doing here. And notice this. Notice that we have a square and a cube here. So the question is, why do we have these? And the answer is, it's based on the counts here. Notice that we had three instances of economy, so we need to take the probability of seeing one instance of economy given a legit document and then raising it to the third power because we have three instances. Okay, so we have to multiply the probabilities three times. And then over here we have two for the government, so we square it. And when we run all of this through, we just plug and chug the numbers that we already calculated from the previous slides. So it just looks like this, and it comes out to be a really, really small number. 0 0.000341, that's the probability. Now we're not done because Naive Base says, okay, look, that's the probability based on my historical training data that this inbound document is legit. So let me go ahead and find the inbound probability that this is actually spam or illegitimate. So we can go ahead and do this, probability of sarcastic. And then you can see all the various squared and cubes and all of that. And then when we end up here is a base probability for this particular inbound document being sarcastic or spam as being even smaller, 0 0.000031. And what ends up happening is, because this probability is so much lower than this probability, the Naive Bayes model says, look, this is a legit headline. I'm gonna predict that this is a legit headline. Now notice that the prediction is not like greater than 50%. It's literally saying, look, I just take the bigger of the two because both of these are astronomically small. And you might think this is extremely simple, and it is, but it's also extremely effective. Naive Bayes is actually a very effective machine learning technique for building things like spam filters. Now with that background in place, let's go ahead and check out the Python and Excel code. So here is the workbook. As I mentioned earlier, there'll be a link in the description below the video where you can go to the GitHub and download this if you would like. Remember, once again, you have to have access to Python and Excel to actually get this to work. So here is our training data. This is the data that we're gonna to use to train the Naive Bayes model. And what we can see here is I have a bunch of headlines here, and this could be anything, right? I'm using sarcastic headlines data, but it could be customer service chats, it could be notes in an IT system, whatever it might be. And what we have is our raw textual data here in this column, and then we have our labels is sarcastic here, zeros and one. Zero means that it's legit, it's not sarcastic, so it's ham, and if it's sarcastic, it's negative, it's spam. So we're gonna go ahead and load this up into Python and Excel as a data frame, and then use our count vectorizer to turn this into a document term matrix. So if I go back over here, so I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that I'm using formula, calculation options manual, otherwise it'll run every single formula every single time, that's really a pain in the butt. And what we can see here is the code for loading up the data. So I'm grabbing my training data here and I'm running it through the Excel function and storing that as a data frame, which I'm calling headlines underscore train. 
and then I'm getting the info on it. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this, and it'll just take a second to run. And what we can see here in the diagnostics pane, let me just move this up for you a little bit. You can see here that we have 4,005 entries. So we have 4,005 rows or 4,005 documents. And of course we have a sarcastic headlines and then article link that just comes with the data set from Kaggle. So now we have our raw textual data load up in a data frame. We can't use it directly, we need to transform it. So we're gonna go ahead and tokenize it. We're going to use the count vectorizer class. So we can see here from sklearn, we're importing count vectorizer. And that's the class that actually transforms our raw textual data into a document term matrix. Now the count vectorizer, its tokenization is pretty basic. It's not great. It, it's functional. You can certainly do real world analytics with it, but in general, it leaves a lot to be desired. And as I mentioned earlier, I've asked Microsoft to include what's known as the NLTK in Python and Excel, because that would allow us to do a lot more cool things with our tokenization well beyond what the count vectorizer does. But this is what we have right now, so we're gonna work with it. So I instantiate a count vectorizer object, and then I can then use it right here to go learn everything that it needs. That's what the fit part means of fit, is go learn from the data what you need, and then transform says, after you've learned it, take the data and then transform it. So go learn, what is the vocab? vocabulary of all these documents. And here's the thing, for the 4,005 rows, I'm gonna have a single column for every unique token for each of the 4,005 documents. So I'm gonna get a lot of columns because it's gonna go through all the text, find every unique token, and every unique token is gonna to get a column across all 4,000. And what I'm gonna do is just print this out real quick so you can see what happens. So when I run this, you can see here that we have 4,005 rows, not surprisingly, because that's how many documents we have. But look at this, we have 9,936 columns. <laughs> so many. Because remember, you get one column for every unique token across all of the documents, okay, across all 4,000 rows. So not surprisingly, what you end up getting is a very wide table of data, and most of the individual cells are zero. Not surprisingly, right? Because for example, if one of the documents has the word mononucleosis in it, which is a very, very rare word to be using, except for outside of maybe medical journals, <laughs> there'd be like one row, we'll have mononucleosis once, and then that entire column will be zeros for everything else because it's just a rare word. This is what's known as a sparse data problem because most of your individual cells in your table are zero. They don't have any information in them. That's just part of text analytics. So what we can do is actually say, look, let's modify this a little bit, but hold on a second. Let's actually take a look at what happens first before we do that. So if I run this code here, what I do is I say, hey, count vectorizer, give me the feature names. So the feature names are the individual tokens. So if I run this and I click on the ND array here, I click on its card, you'll notice I get 9,936. And you can see these examples of the tokens, 000, 000, 000 zoo, zookeeper, Zuckerberg, <laughs> ZZ, so on and so forth. Now, I need to warn you, by the way, if you actually download this workbook from the GitHub and play around with it, there are adult words, for lack of a better way of describing it in the data, right? This is real life text, real life data, so there are swear words and curse words and that sort of thing. But we can see here some of the examples of the tokens. Now, the problem is, is that we don't want that many columns. That ends up being very difficult for us to do analytics on because a lot of the columns are gonna be empty or essentially just mostly zeros. So what we can do is we can say, look, let's trim this down. Let's trim the number of columns down. And how we do that is by recreating our count vectorizer. But what we do is we pass in a parameter. There are many parameters on the count vectorizer, but this one's super handy. And this one says, look, only keep a column in the document term matrix if it shows up in at least five out of the 4,005 rows, which seems to be a reasonable assumption. Now you can obviously tune this, you can make it less, you can make it more, depending on your situation. But what this does is says, look, if words are like mononucleosis, like they only show up once in one document, I don't wanna worry about it, it's just too rare. So we can actually run this and we can see the results. Notice we've gone from 9,936 columns down to 1455, that's awesome. Okay, that's exactly what we wanna do. We shrunk our dimensional space, which is good. Now that we have a document term matrix that has our 1455 columns, this is the data we wanna use, we can now train a naive Bayes model on it. So how we do that is pretty simple. We just instantiate something known as multinomial NB, that's the name of the class 
in the scikit-learn library, which is the machine learning library you get in Python and Excel. And we can create an object, which I'm going to call naive Bayes model. Multinomial NB stands for naive Bayes, not surprisingly. And then what we do is we say, hey, naive Bayes, go ahead and fit yourself to the data. Go ahead and learn from the data as we saw in the slides. And we can see here, we feed it the document term matrix, which is the counts of the individual tokens for each document. And then we also have to pass in, not surprisingly, the label. And then it learns real quick. And this is super fast. If I get control enter and run this, boom. Naive Bayes is great. It trains really fast and it also makes predictions really, really fast. And it's also super useful for text analytics. So it's a win, win, win. All right. So now that we've got that, what we're going to do is load up a separate collection of data, a test set. As you'll notice here in my workbook, I actually have my training data and my test data. So what I'll do here is just load up my test data set as a data frame, pretty much all the same code. Now look at it's highlighted. <laughs> for some reason, Python and Excel, you know, it's not quite production code yet. And so if I run this, now you can see that here in the diagnostics pane that my test data set is 1719 sarcastic headlines or 1719 documents. Now here's what's really super cool. Because I've trained, since I've built a count vectorizer, I'm going to reuse that object on the test data set to transform it. And the reason for that is I need to make sure that all of the columns are exact the same between the training data and the test data. And then text analytics, that's almost never the case, right? Because if you have some documents in your test data set, they might have words, very, very likely that they're going to have words that aren't in the training data set and vice versa. So we just have to standardize on using only the terms that can, that come from the training data set and then apply them transform the test data set to match the training data set, because that's the only way the predictions with the model is going to work. So what I can do here is move down the cell, and you can see here the code for reusing the count vectorizer. And notice I'm not using fit transform here, because I don't need to learn anything. I've already learned before on the previous cell. Now I'm just transforming. And what am I transforming? I'm transforming the test headlines. And what that'll do is give me back a data frame that's got the same 1,455 columns as we saw before. So if I run this, you can see in the diagnostic output, sure enough, 1,719 rows and 1,455 columns. Everything's gonna line up, it's gonna be awesome. And now I can make my predictions. And we can see here how I do that. I create my predictions by going to my naive Bayes model object, calling predict on it, and then I pass in the doc term matrix for my test data not the training data, because we've used that to train the model. Now we're going to test it. And I get back essentially a collection of zeros and ones. Zero means it's not sarcastic, it's ham, it's good. One means it's spam. And then what I can do is use the accuracy score function from the scikit-learn library, and I pass it in the actual values, because my test data set has the actual labels, right? That's my baseline. So I can take the baseline and compare it to my predictions, and then print out how accurate is my model. How many of the predictions did it get correct? So if I run this code, we can see here in the diagnostic output that this model got 78.65% of the predictions correct. That's pretty good for a first pass. Now, there's a couple of things you might be wondering, be like, well, Dave, that's not very good. Well, I want it to be much higher than that. How could I improve the accuracy of this model? Well, there's a few things you could do. One is you could play around with that min DF parameter. Another thing that would help is potentially doing better tokenization once the NLTK is available, for example, that would certainly help. And usually what's even better yet than all those things is just get more data. A good email spam filter, like from outlook.com or Gmail, are trained probably on billions of emails. That's why they're pretty accurate, because they have billions of data points to work with. So naive Bayes, the more data you feed it, the better its predictions are going to be. So if you can get more data, that's usually the best thing to do. Make no mistake, Python and Excel is all about empowering you with data science so that you can have more impact at work. This video is just the first in a series where I'm going to demonstrate a bunch of real world data science techniques that are useful to any professional. Next up, my video is going to cover how to cluster text documents. So, hey Dave, I've got textual documents, but I don't have the labels like I saw in this video. What do I do? Well, you use something like k-means clustering to grab your documents and put them in one pile and put the other documents in another pile. And then you look at them and you're like, oh, this pile is my marketing documents and this pile is my finance documents. Commonly done super useful, super powerful. When that video is ready, it'll show up here on the screen as a tile. In the meantime, I'll put up another one of my Python and Excel videos talking about machine learning, just in case you're interested. Until next time, please stay healthy, and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.